So while the huddle is actually going on, um, you all are invited to sit, submit questions in real time. Um, that Soraya, uh, through a link that Soraya has emailed everyone, and I'm going to have Soraya go ahead and provide more details on how to submit questions in real time. Soraya? Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Um, so as Dr. Tang mentioned, I just recently sent out an email to everybody with a link. So um, to submit your, if you have any questions that come up throughout the call, feel free to submit them there. Um, you just have to navigate to the link, and you just, um, it's similar to the RSVP form. You just give your name and province, or you can choose not to do so if you wish to remain anonymous. And then you can ask any question that you have, either relating to COVID or T1D management. Um, and yep, I'll be continuously uh, monitoring the survey um, until the very end of the call, um, so you can submit your questions. Okay, great. Um, so to make the session run smoothly, um, we're going to have a, a few ground rules. The first ground rule is, um, and if, again, if you're not muted, can you mute yourself? Because it's hard to, there's a lot of background noise. So again, if you're not muted, go ahead and mute yourself. So the first, the first ground rule is only one person talks at a time. So either Jerry is speaking or the person who submitted the question is speaking. Um, number two, to be mindful of time. If a discussion around a specific question goes beyond a reasonable time, I'll go ahead and give a warning signal indicating that the person has 10, 10 seconds to wrap up their comments. Um, third, let's really be respectful of each other. So no interrupting, no unmuting to interrupt someone when um, the person who has the question is speaking. And finally, um, we're going to make sure that we address every single question you have. So if that means that Jerry and I um, are, need to continue past 730, so you can ask your question, we're, we're happy to do so. So don't, um, I don't want anyone to feel anxious that they're not going to get a turn. Um, you will, you know, happy to have you, we're happy to answer questions as long as it takes. So now I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing our guest expert, Jerry Klein. Um, Jerry has a master's degree in nursing from UBC, and she has been a certified diabetes educator since 1998. She served on the examination committee for the Canadian Diabetes Educators Certification Board, and that's the board that makes the test that everyone needs to pass in order to be a certified diabetes educator. Uh, she's a past executive of the Vancouver Chapter of Diabetes Association Educators Section, she was a member of the Editorial Advisory Board of the Diabetes Communicator for three years, um, a publication offering information to Diabetes Canada's Diabetes Educator section. And Jerry is currently the national editor for the Canadian Journal of Diabetes. Um, and aside from her personal accolades, um, Jerry honestly is the most generous person I've ever known. Um, she puts her patients first, even if it means that she has to drive out to Surrey or Richmond or another city to do a home visit. And some of you know Jerry and know how generous she is. Um, she knows more about managing type 1 and living with the challenges and frustrations than any other physician I've ever worked with. So without further ado, Jerry. Uh, uh, Tricia, thank you. That was very kind. A uh, little bit about myself. Um, I became interested in diabetes care when I moved to Vancouver and realized I didn't know a lot about it. I started studying it's a, uh, to become a certified diabetes educator. It's a two-year self-study program when my then six-year-old was diagnosed. Then my real education began, and I learned the challenges of living with diabetes. Aaron, my son... Our son is now 30, having lived with it for 24 plus years. Okay. Um, I think we're ready for questions. Great. So the first question is from an anonymous um, person, and you can, you know, let us know if you want to unmute. But why do people say? that T1Ds are at greater risk for contracting COVID-19. 
I understand the general line that we have more compromised immune systems, but would like to understand what exactly this means and the science behind it, um, b- behind how it interacts and affects COVID. Uh, I'm going to start with the idea that at the beginning, we said people who lived with diabetes, meaning both type 1 and type 2. In fact, what they're finding is well-controlled type 1 persons are not more at risk than others. It seems to be people who live with type 2 who have complications, kidney, heart, etc., We're not exactly sure why people with higher A1Cs seem to be more at risk as well. There was a rather complicated um, research study that I've just read that talked about the COVID-19 attacking the hemoglobin molecule. And because people with diabetes have a glycated hemoglobin molecule that's more so than the general public, the people with high A1Cs would therefore be more at risk. But if you are a well-controlled, without complications, you should not be any more at risk than your peers of the same age. The people who are seemingly at risk, just as a by the way, apparently it affects men more than women, and we feel that it's because of their hemoglobin is higher, and we feel that it's, there are young people who are affected, but it exponentially goes up after the age of 60, and then dramatically goes up after 70. I'm 65 this year, so my risk is higher than my son's who lives with type 1 and is well controlled. Uh, Is the person who asked the question uh, online, they asked about self-isolating and and practicing social distance. Everyone should be doing that. Everyone without any preconditions should be self-isolating. social distancing, six feet away. When you're standing in line at the grocery store, when you're walking your dog, you talk to the neighbor at a distance. You have Zoom uh, dinner parties, not in person. Social isolation is the way to go for the next foreseeable few weeks. Sorry, if the person who asked that question um, would like to go ahead and unmute and make any comments, please feel free to do so. If not, I can go on to the next question. Okay, great. Uh, Next question. I would like to hear general discussion around the implications of COVID-19 for someone living with type 1, just such as stocking medical supplies mental health and seeking help if needed during the time of this medical crisis? Um, Yes, it's very trying. Um, When you think that people are stocking up on toilet paper and that's not a medical necessity, it becomes very worrisome to think that your life-giving medications may be at risk for not being available. My understanding, and I've checked with all of the companies, many pharmacies in Vancouver, Surrey, and Richmond, and the supply chain has not been affected. So far, people stocking up have reduced in some pharmacies, but the pharmacy has been able to order and restock Many people are understandably worried, but at this time, we're not anticipating a crisis in being able to to supply people who live with diabetes. 
Having said that, I want to tell you that if, heaven forbid, you are not able to get hold of the type of insulin that you particularly need for whatever period, there are alternatives. So if you're on Basilglar, you can be switched to other medications that will do the same thing. There is a lot of stock of other medications, including all of the mealtime insulins, all of the long-acting, so that my feel is keep your normal supply. If you are concerned about becoming ill and needing extra supply, keep a couple of months' supply on hand, but you don't have to stock up for the next year or foreseeable future. Okay, the person who asked that question, if you'd like to unmute and um, make any follow-up comments, please feel free. Okay, if not, I'm going to go to the next question. If I consider my diabetes in good control, um, parentheses or quotes, air quotes, would I still be at higher risk to do less well when I get exposed to this new virus? And what exactly is good control? If you had to put numbers, what what is good control? I'll I'll start with the last question. It it depends. It depends on how old you are and how many complications. If I'm going to use my son as my test patient, he is 30, has lived with diabetes for 24 years has no complications, his good control would be an A1C of under 7. He uses a freestyle Vibra, and in our clinic, I work for Tom Elliott at BC Diabetes, we consider good control in his target range of 4 to 9, 70% of the time. Every endocrinologist has a different definition of good control, but rule of thumb, if you're without complications and you're under 65, chances are an A1C under 7 and a target of 4 to 9 with most of your readings in that target, and that would be considered good control. Okay, the person who submitted that question, if you'd like to go ahead and follow up with any comments or additional questions, please feel free to unmute. Okay, next question. My control has been tough for a couple of years due to hormone, awkward relationship with my former endo, um, and my behavior due to depression and circumstances. I'm hearing that tight control is important in order to fight off COVID-19 um, and was working on tightening it, but am concerned about low blood sugars as historically they open the door and make me vulnerable to viruses. Historically, um, I get a lot of lows when I work on um, tightening it up. Is there any science to this low blood sugar here, or have I created this anomaly? Thanks. I, I want to tell you something that I tell all of my patients. Get some Teflon. Guilt don't stick. You didn't ask for this. You didn't cause it. So if you're afraid, it's probably understandable, and I don't think you've created anything. Yes, lows are worrisome. I would ask you have you changed your endocrinologist? If you've got an awkward relationship, either chat with them or move on. Get someone that you can contact and that you can trust. Second thing is, has that endocrinologist or your diabetes team assisted you on adjusting blood sugars? I particularly like a website run by Adam Brown called 42 Things That Affect My Blood Sugar. He looked at 42 things that made his blood sugar go up, down, or sideways, and now is able to pr 
predict and adjust his own insulin. You have to figure out what's causing the lows. Sometimes it's exercise, sometimes not. And Bye, figure out how to adjust you. your insulin so you don't have those lows. Um, depression is a huge part of diabetes, and I think something that is under-recognized. And getting help with that, I think, will help you manage your diabetes. Diabetes is hard, and it's 24-7, and it never goes away. Getting some help on the mental health side makes it easier. I believe every person who lives with diabetes should have a confidant or a counselor of some description to make sure that they don't become overwhelmed and depressed. So um, you're not alone in this. Please do reach out. As for the lows, you're going to have to figure out what causes the lows for you and get your team to help you adjust your blood sugars. Um, any questions with that? Are you good? Thank you. I am going to unmute myself. <laughs> um, I really appreciate your answer, and I have a great new endocrinologist. Um, and I've had diabetes for 44 years, so uh, I've gone through all kinds of twists and turns with it. And right now, it's just a, a really tough period of a couple of years. And um, I have to say, being isolated has helped me focus a little bit, but I'm still looking for mental health uh, support. And I am really curious about if anybody else shares the experience of having low blood sugars, feeling like they're more susceptible to catching things while they're exhausted from a series of lows. Um, I am curious about that. To my knowledge, there is no correlation between low blood sugars and catching more viruses, etc. In fact, probably the opposite is true. Um, the lower you can get your A1C without having um, severe lows will actually normalize your immune system or a system normalizing it and help you ward off. Um, right. the mental health issues will help you, will uh, make that a more difficult journey. Yeah. <laughs> a very yeah. difficult journey. <laughs> yeah. Your, your, with diabetes, your incident of depression goes up. So as I tell my patients, and I use humor because I want you to remember these things, you're not crazy. You are depressed, and understandably so. Reach out. We can give you help. If, if you had a broken leg, you'd use crutches. Reach out for mental health support. Thank you. Okay, next question. Do I have to be isolated from my daughter if she is a nurse at the hospital? That's a million-dollar question. It depends where your LPN nurse is working. Um, the chance, if she's in a merge, she may very well be in contact with covid uh, 19 people who live with it, she should, uh, more than likely, her employment uh, agency has given her a protocol on what to do with her uniform, etc. when she gets home. Um, if, you know, so the other thing is you want to look at your own risk. Are you type 1 or type 2? Do you have complications? How is your A1C? And then go from there. Has your daughter traveled recently? Does she have any other indicators that she may be a carrier? Um, it's very much... It, it, the other thing is, how old are you? So that if you're above 60, your risk 
goes up not because of your diabetes, because of your age. So that for people, especially above 70, we're telling them to isolate from their family, even if the family has no contact, no known contact with anyone who's ill. So that one, my best answer is maybe. But those are the questions you would ask before um, before making that decision. Does she live with you? Okay, I'm here. Hi. Hi. I am over the age of 60, and I have complications and poor control. Well, so and, and your your control is above target. I'm going to just I, – I, I've got kind of a – a thing and everybody will know about this. You didn't ask for this. You she didn't talks yeah. like Aaron Elk talks with actual things he's like most nuts loud. Sorry? So so basically your target is your blood sugars are above target. You'll work at getting them down. If you're above sixty with complications you should probably be self-isolating from most people okay. for several weeks. Yeah, I I am, but just I'm just I'm on my own, so I was disappointed oh. when my daughter said that she couldn't see me anymore. So I and was just checking. Yeah. Yes, so. yeah, and that's you and I are about the same vintage, and yeah. I haven't seen my kids either. I feel for you. One thing you might want to do, and I've been a nurse for 45 years, who knew I wasn't washing my hands properly? I'm anal yeah. about that. But I would suggest you Google the WHO guidelines okay. on hand washing. Oh, well, I've different. been, I, yeah. I've seen a couple of the things about how long and where yes, and how. Yes, yes. yes. So, but yes, okay. a, a, your age means your daughter can come to the window. <laughs> okay. Now, you also asked about skin tearing with the Omnipod. I did. You Now, you ordered some skin barrier wipes. I did. Is, and they is that arrived. skin tack? Um, it's no, no, it's the one that Omnipod recommended. Um, is it kind of a plastic... Well, I I just got them, so I'm just going to try them tonight for the first okay. time. But Omnipod says that the cannula will insert. Okay. It's the Caval Cavalar barrier wipe. Cal okay, a barrier wipe just it usually goes through. If people are using something like a Kegaderm or some me fix or something, they should probably cut a little hole where the cannula goes in, but a barrier wipe can, will allow the cannula to go through. Just as a, okay. by the way, and I don't, you didn't ask this, but I'm going to throw it in, is um, your skin barrier wipes are probably fairly pricey. They they often come in a bottle with a wand that's about half the price. So, okay. So I would suggest, you know, the cost of diabetes for the things that aren't covered really adds up. And I think that it's wise to kind of look for these things. You're not sharing it with anybody else. It works no. well. So... Um, the one that my son uses is skin tack and those wipes are about seventy five cents each. I got a bottle of skin tack that'll last them all year and it okay. was about twenty five dollars. Yeah. Okay, so I just got fifty fifty of them for of the just the wipes, the individual yep. ones. I just got fifty from Diabetes Express for Yep. I don't know, I can't remember. Thirty five. Well, and then just have a look to see if you can get one that's got a wand or in a bottle. Um, okay. And and often it'll cut the cost for you. Okay. Thank you. You're All right, welcome. great. Next question. If I'm feeling ill or fighting a bug, this almost always shows up in my blood glucose readings. There are much higher, greater fluctuations, harder to control, um, 
uh, something. Sorry, I think I got the wrong. Uh, if we were infected with COVID-19 but we're still asymptomatic, would the presence of it being in our bodies reflected in our blood glucose numbers? Right. Thanks, Erin. Okay. I, I wanted, I've written down some of the um, things to look for with COVID-19. It has a fever above 38 with a dry cough, fatigue, shortness of breath, and once again, men are more likely than others. The temperature and the cough are diagnostic. Many times your blood sugar will go through the roof when you're becoming ill with the flu, but it isn't 100%. I often tell my patients that the only really good thing about diabetes is you can tell when you're getting sick because your blood sugars start to go up and you know you've got to take care of yourself to ward off a flu. With COVID, you may go up or you may just stay the same. You can never rely on your blood sugars going up. You've got to test, 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 test. So if you're concerned that you do have COVID, we are telling you not to run to the hospital. Call 811. And the things you're looking for is a fever above 38, a dry cough, and shortness of breath and then get help. If your blood sugars are up, you, most of you have been given some type of sick day management tool um, to, to manage with your diabetes. You can Google or your endocrinologist has given it. The thing to remember with sick day management is check and correct. Have supplies, make sure that you've got enough testing strips or CGMs or freestyle Libras and check often. Use small amounts of mealtime insulin to, to correct, but be gentle with yourself. Make sure that you correct the blood sugars over 16, but be gentle with them. You can get it two hours later and correct again. You've also got to check through the night when you're sick with the flu. Lots of fluids. Even if you're throwing up, you're taking your, your um, insulin. If you're more than a few hours with throwing up and that you can't keep something down, contact your endocrinologist. Chances are when you're, you've got the flu or a fever, your dehydration is a big deal. So you want to have 250 cc's, eight ounces, every hour while you're awake. That's pretty hard to do, but give it a go. Diet pop, diet uh, consomme, sugar-free jello, water is always good. If you are low, if you can't eat, you can go to regular pop, but that's only three quarters of a cup, about 200 cc's. A little bit of juice, milk, or popsicles often help. But push the fluids. Check your blood sugars. If your temperatures stay high and you can't get your blood sugars down, especially if they're running around 16 or higher, check for ketones. Most of my patients couldn't find their ketone strips to save themselves, as a, by the way, your Freestyle Libra is a ketone machine as well. Um, but if you can't find ketone strips and you don't have any on hand, consider yourself to be throwing ketones if you're above 16. Push the fluids, and if you can't get it down for within the 12 hours, call a physician. If you throw up more than twice in an eight-hour period, call your physician. Okay, the person who asked that question, would you like to unmute and follow up?
Okay, next question. Given current information, when is the expected peak um, in BC, the peak of COVID in British Columbia? That is the million dollar question. We don't know. It depends on how well people self-isolate. If you were down at the beach earlier in the week, they weren't self-isolating terribly well. And people were having play dates, etc. If the schools go back, which it's unlikely they will go back before the end of June, the peak will come much quicker. The COVID-19 is in our system, in our, in our community for the next several months until we get a, a vaccine to prevent it. And I, I know that there's a lot of controversy. A lot of people are anti-vaccine. I can't stress how important this will be to get once and when it comes out. But all we're doing is flattening the curve. And until there is a COVID vaccine, we will have COVID-19 in our community. And we will have to be vigilant. Okay, that same person asked, how long does the virus live on paper, clothing, metal, and plastic? Well, interestingly, we don't have research. I did some research on that, and they have done 10 experimental conditions for the viruses, and they found that um, the longest place that virus, the COVID virus lived was on stainless steel and plastic. Interestingly, copper and cardboard had the, the lowest rate, so that if you had a virus on cardboard, it was more likely to die off than if it was sitting on a stainless steel um, sink, say. The wisdom that seems to be is consider everything contaminated. Wash your hands every hour. Moisturize after you're done, but know how to wash your hands and do it a lot. I don't know if people are still on Facebook or is that only for us over 65, but there's a funny little um, cartoon going around with those um, cones of shame that you put on your animals, and it said, it's for your own good. You have to not touch your face and expect the COVID-19 COVID to be around until we see the vaccine, which they predict is going to be past Christmas. Sorry, that wasn't my question, but just to follow up on that. So COVID compared to um, seasonal flu, like the other types, those characteristics of how long it lasts on surfaces, is that quite a bit different than the norm? Or is that, or is that pretty similar? Because I feel like I catch a flu every year. And I, I'm sorry, I, I, it's not my area of expertise on in infectious diseases, but my feel is that it probably is the norm. I'm going to remind everyone to mute. So if you're not talking, um, you need to put your phone on mute because we can hear the background. We can hear a car honking its horn. We can hear your dog. So please put your phone on mute. Okay, Jerry, did you want to Hi. follow up? Hi. So I think that at present, it's probably very similar to the flu. Um, I would ask you if you do get a flu shot every year, sir. Uh, yeah, I do, actually. Yep. And, and But you still feel you come under the weather. Do you have any other pre-existing conditions such as asthma? 
Uh, no asphalt, just I think diabetes. How long have yeah, you lived with diabetes? Uh, since 2001, so about 20, yeah, almost almost 19 years. May I ask your age? 30. Say again? I'm 30. Okay, so do you get enough sleep at night? Uh, I think I could always use more sleep. <laughs> okay. And, and you know, it, it's, aging is such a lovely event, isn't it? <laughs> uh, you got to get to bed on time. You have to have, you got to eat your green vegetables. Um, watch it with smoking, drinking. Make sure you exercise. Laying in bed when you've got a cold will be the fastest way to get a pneumonia. Even if you're feeling really ill, socially isolate and go for a walk. Wash your hands like a crazy person. You're just, you have to absolutely wash, and I would say during flu season every hour. The hand gels are all very nice, but they don't do nearly the job washing does. Thank you very much. Good luck there. Okay, next question. What are the COVID symptoms that will make managing diabetes a challenge beyond the usual stress of illness, right. like nausea and vomiting? It, it seems to be the temperature and the general unwell feeling that causes your blood sugar goes up. It's a stress reaction to have the blood sugar goes up, and it seems that. As of, by the way, my reading seems to be that, and they don't know why, and it's very early. Next week I'll probably tell you something different. But they find that people who have diarrhea seem to have worse outcomes. So the, they, they're not sure exactly why, but the stress reaction for your body to fight this will put your blood sugars up. And we think it's something to do with adrenaline, but don't know for sure. Does anyone want to unmute if that was your question? It wasn't a question, but I didn't quite hear. Did you say people with diarrhea have better or worse outcomes? They have worse outcomes, apparently. They they are sicker than... doesn't mean that it's, you know, a, a, a completely fatal, but they do find that people who have diarrhea with COVID seem to be sicker and have not... And they, they're sicker, they're sicker longer... And if they're over 65, and especially if they're over 70, they are, they should be admitted to ICU. Okay. Um, did you want to follow up the person who asked? No, that's great. Thanks. Great. All right. Next question. Because I am self-isolating, I'm not able to go for walks. I'm doing daily exercise at home but this does not seem to help with lowering my blood sugars. I'm finding that I'm running above 10 most of the time. Should I change my unit carb ratio temporarily? I am guessing that stress might also be partially to blame. And, and that's an interesting question, and thank you for asking it. Um, I'm interested to know why you can't go for a walk. Um, you need to stay six feet away from everybody. You need to not touch anything but other than that um, yes go for a walk when I'm out there walking I and I had to self-isolate because I went to Vietnam I tell my neighbors I'm self-isolating I need to be away from you but we can talk across the street so absolutely get out there. It's the best thing for your lungs and your blood sugar. As, But you're probably not going to be as active. So yes, you are going to have to up the insulin or lower the carbs. Interestingly, some of the activities that you will do at home may actually 
increase your blood sugar. Not every exercise decreases blood sugar. So when my son was, he was a rower during high school and university, it put his blood sugar up to 25. Playing basketball put him down at the twos and threes. They're about the same and uh, expenditure of energy. So I'm not sure why your blood sugars are going up. It may be the stress. It may be that you're not as active, but I would encourage you to get out at least a couple of times a day. Hi, thank you for answering that. Um, we were told when we came back from the UK last week that we shouldn't go outside the house. And so that's why we haven't been walking. I'm walking around my garden. That's about all I can do at the moment. Yeah. And, and that doesn't do anything, does it? No. <laughs> the, the one thing, it, it's it's been a real nightmare because nobody has a real template that you should do this, you should do that, you shouldn't do this. And and. Because of it, it's a mishmash of a whole bunch of different healthcare professionals giving all sorts of different advice. Yeah, I was listening to, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten her name, the woman who's always on the news. Oh, Bonnie the Henry. Ask. Say again? Bonnie Henry? Possibly. Who yeah. is the, um, the physician who seems to be yeah. the face the poor woman who was losing herself, um, she said, you should be going out, but you should be six feet away from everyone. Okay, because that wasn't the advice we were given when we came back. Yes, and and you will find, ask a different person and get a different answer. It isn't well organized. Mm. It, it's very... Um, you, you shouldn't be going into... Safeway. No, no, no. We understood that. We just you know, you shouldn't walk touch away. anything. You can't touch anything. You can't go to the neighbors. You can't go no. outside. But can you walk down the street and cross the street if someone's coming towards you? Absolutely. Really? Yes. It's okay. not flying around um, in the air. It is on surfaces. If someone sneezes on you, you might be covered in droplets so stay away from them mm. if you touch something you may pick it up but you're not going to bring it in on your feet okay thank you if I can make a suggestion actually there's a there's a lot of good videos on YouTube with like you know quick little home workouts I think it's been blowing up even more recently with everyone quarantined uh -huh. and there's a lot of good like stationary cardio I mean, you don't have to go exactly to the feet, but you can get you can get sweat on from it. And, you know, if you're if you're tiny, you need cardio to sort of help regulate the sugar and stuff. I think that that might help. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't want to hijack it. Just no, no, I'm good. Okay, I, next. I oh, sorry, Jerry. Did you want to say answer? Sarah? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, did you have a follow up? I. Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, I, I was thinking, and you're right, there are a lot of things you can do at home with cardio, etc. cetera. Um, isolating at home is, is depressive. It's, it's you're, you're scared, you're alone, and you don't see anyone. Um, exercise helps. So getting out, exercise, even if it's done alone, helps. But getting out and walking will at least get you out and, and I believe, help mental health issues as well. Just as a follow-up, yes. uh, I thought there was a difference be between um, self-quarantine and self-isolation, that you could go outside the way you're describing if you've not been diagnosed with COVID or you, and you have no symptoms, but that if you have been diagnosed or you have active symptoms, you are not meant to leave your, your house. And I, and I haven't been um, involved in the care of anyone with COVID, 
um, my understanding is of people with mild symptoms that it's basically a self-isolation pretty much as opposed to hidden in the house. Um, but I could be, you know, um, I don't think they have completely given guidelines. All right, next question. I've read that taking ACE inhibitors may increase your risk of con contracting COVID as well as uh, the severity of your symptoms. I've also read that they may be protective of lung tissue um, should you contract COVID. And yes, I know each patient consult with their, um, consults with their doctor. I'm trying to make sense of the research though. So I'm asking, this, um, I'm asking Jerry's opinion on the research. There, the research came out and it was a, a comment not terribly well based in a study. The, they are not sure if the ACE inhibitors are going to be um, a problem or not, but the general thing now is to continue your ACE inhibitor Call your endo if you're very concerned, but they felt that it the comment to stop the ACE inhibitor, and there was also a comment on uh, ibuprofen that it may prolong or or increase the likelihood of getting COVID, and they the two or three weeks down the line they're thinking that in fact that it isn't based on great science and we need to have more studies to see if in fact there is a causative relationship or there is some link. Right now we feel the ACE inhibitor will do more good than harm because the, the link is so weak. Does the person who asked that question like to follow up? Okay, great. Um, Denise Cook, uh, my biggest concern is my safety if I have to help my 87-year-old mother. How do I keep myself safe if she's sick? I do not have an N95 mask. That's a great question. And your mother is at very, very high risk. She, Her risk is the much higher than yours, even if you're over 65. Denise, are you on the line? Hi, I'm on the line. I am 65. So her risk is very high. Does she live with you, Denise? No, she lives alone, and I've had serious, serious conversations with her to self-isolate and not leave the house. And yeah. while she won't listen, I've had to tell her that it's about me and her, not just her. Okay. And and when she doesn't self isolate, does she, where is she going? No, she is. She is now that I got very very strong about it. She is self isolating, but uh, so I'm hoping that she won't get anything. Um, but if she does, my question. I mean, it's it's. It's an emotional question rather than it is very emotional. how do you go and how do you not go? If I if she gets sick, I'm going. So what do I do to protect myself? Well, and to protect her. It, it's well, really, I mean, my my going well. will be my going will be trying to get her into the hospital, but she lives in a small community, and the chances yes. of her getting in are slim. Are slim. Um, your the masks apparently do very little. I have heard that many people are making their own masks, and I read uh, an article that wasn't terribly scientific, but they did some study where the person used a a tea towel, a doubled tea towel, as a mask, and apparently it did about as well as the mask that you can buy or can't buy anymore, um, those regular surgical masks. So if you have to make a mask, get one of your tea towels, double it, 
and try putting that around. Remembering when you take it off, you want to be careful not to get it all over your hands and wash it immediately and wa wash your hands immediately. Um, we don't know if it's on clothing, etc., so you might want to wear protective house coats over your clothing when you see her, and that's both for her and for you, so you're not bringing anything in and you're not taking anything out. Once again, wash your house coat. Um, hand washing very diligently. And if you don't have to see her for her protection as well as yours, don't. I know that if she does get sick, you will go because she's your mother. But um, do you know if she had been seeing um, people in a close? close I, I have been very strong and insisting using very high volume language of my mother to stay home. So I think we're we're doing all the things that we need to do to protect her. It's just that managing from Vancouver to Seashelt is obviously the thing. Plus, I work at Vancouver Coastal, and I am still at work, unfortunately. And um, while I believe I'm reasonably safe, um, bringing what do you do at Vancouver her? Coastal? Uh, I just do transcription, but you know, medical reports, so it's still yes, necessary. Okay. But I'm in an area. But you're in the environment. You're in the environment. I, I'm in the hospital, but I'm yeah. I'm quite safe. I feel, I mean, as much as you can be. Um, but if she gets sick, I'm. I mean, I know I'm going. There's just there's nothing you can do about it, right? But I mean, you can call the ambulance, and they might. Anyway, that's all just the emotional stuff. Who knows whether they'll take her? But I've got her on isolation. I've got me at work. It, it's an emotional question. It was just like an feeling out of like concern like how do you deal with the emotional part of not going to your mother when she's sick yes it it's it's really um quite tragic isn't it to yeah. even have to think about it and you're and just gonna go I mean, it doesn't matter what you say you're going anyway i know at least to get her to the hospital right my father's 85 and I listened to him cough in Thunder Bay yesterday and thought, what will I do if something yeah. happens? Yes, it's it's very emotional. It's very upsetting. Um, so the only thing you can do really is cover your face, get her to the hospital. And basically, I mean, I can try and manage that from here, but if not, you got to go. Yeah. Hmm. And I, I, from all your comments, and thank you for all of them, I realize that, I mean, I am 65, and I'm a, a, an 8.1 a, A1C last time I, my last thing. So, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm reasonable rather than, like, at high risk, but at least I'm reasonable. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just going to go back to one thing. It's with, if you have symptoms, Basically, there's concern on self-quarantining and self-isolating and what does each mean, et cetera, is if you have symptoms, you have to stay away 100% from other people. That includes everyone in your house or apartment or wherever. You don't use public transportation. Um, use a separate bathroom. And that's 100%. Even if you have to use the powder room and everybody else is using. If you don't have a separate bathroom, clean it between uses. That is absolute. If, you know, you, you separate yourself, you can go outside because it's not going to be in the air. Um, but you are six feet or further from everyone you don't come anywhere close you don't go to your family doctor or your emergency room you phone first you've mm -hmm. got to wash your hands there just isn't any other way and there's no sharing of dishes drinking glasses anything 
anything that you touch has to be disinfected. Anything that anyone else has touched has to be disinfected. Your house is cleaner than you've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. So, and that's if you feel you're at high risk, somebody over 80 is a high risk, or you feel you have some symptoms. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next question, if that's okay, Denise. Sure. Okay. Um, is there any data yet on T1Ds and COVID regarding infection rates, acuity, just any of those statistics? Um, have enough people gotten affected that you can give any numbers? I, I, uh, the short answer is no. I, In anticipation of this call, I went to see what data I could find. And the data seems to indicate that folks with type 2 are getting it, but even that isn't terribly clear. I spoke with several endocrinologists, and their feel was that type 1s, especially those under 60, were not and well controlled were no more at risk and are not getting it having said that canada isn't testing so we don't know for the countries that are testing they're not even dividing it to men and women so not only do we not know who's getting it we don't know for sure which comorbidities will cause problems. Our feel has been that of the patients that these endocrinologists are seeing, their type 1s are not affected. And that's my belief. I have contact with several, um, and all of my reading seems to be that it's just because you have type 1 does not mean you have some type of magnet in your body that attracts them. You don't. Does anyone want to follow up and unmute on that question? I have a follow-up question, please. Yes. So, talking about the, so there's no greater risk that we understand if you have type 1 um, around COVID-19. Is that as in there's no greater risk of contracting it? And what's the, do we know the difference between the risk of contracting it as opposed to the risk of, for example, hospitalization and complications if you do get it? Sorry, I didn't hear the second part of contracting it as opposed to... So contract, the risk of contracting it as someone with type 1 as opposed to the risk of complications and hospitalization should you actually contract it. Okay, if you get... COVID-19, I'll start with that one, you are at high risk because of the problems with high blood sugars and managing all of the things with sick day management. Anyone who gets the flu who becomes ill with any type of infection, uh, uh, viral or not, who lives with diabetes, has a high risk. You're not at risk if, because you live with diabetes, but if and when you get it, you want to hop right on your, your sick day management, make sure that you are testing, 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 and keeping the blood sugars down. It's very easy to convert to a ketoacidotic state, and that's not a fun diagnosis. So yes, when you if and when you get it, um, you want to take care of yourself and hopefully manage it at home. Keep in touch with your endocrinologist. Don't go to eMERGE immediately because you don't know if you have it or not. Try to manage the symptoms, but keep in touch with an endo. Makes sense. Thank you. All right, next question. As type 1, do we have quicker access to COVID tests? What should be, what should our protocol be 
as type ones if we develop COVID symptoms, which you kind of answered. But. Okay, so the short answer is no. Uh, you don't have any quicker access. I don't know anybody who does, and um, I'm not even sure if physicians or, or healthcare providers going back into the hospital have quicker access. They thought they did, and now I'm hearing they're waiting five, six, ten days for, for their results. So while they were tested, they didn't get results. Type 1, no, you're not getting more access. Um, now, for the second part of the question, could you repeat that, please? Trish? Sorry. Um, what should our protocol be as type 1 if we develop COVID symptoms? If you develop COVID symptoms, yes. you develop a dry cough, a temperature. Check your sugars every two hours. That includes during the night. Check and correct high blood sugars. Excuse me. <coughs> Keep in touch with your endocrinologist. <coughs> Do not go into eMERGE until you phone. If you have shortness of breath, you want to get a phone call, that would be a high priority. Shortness of breath is a symptom of COVID, and it's also a symptom of anxiety. So you should probably see a dry cough in addition to a temp that's higher than 38. You won't have sputum. You will feel very short of breath and not with exertion. Your sugars may go up or not, but you continue to check them every two hours and get hold of your endocrinologist. And if you aren't able to, the endocrinologist on call and do whatever they tell you to do. Okay, next question. Or oh, um, The person who submitted that question, which you did in real time, did you want to respond or provide more commentary? Okay, um, next question. If the incubation period is 5 to 14 days, when is the best time to test? What if I go get tested? It's negative, but then I get it soon after. Does this impact the false negative results? Well, and, and if, if you get tested and it's negative, you may not have had it there then, so it may not be a false negative. It just means you didn't have it on the day that they put the throat swab down or the nasopharyngeal swab down, but you may have picked it up on the way home. Who knows? So they are not testing for people, or they're not testing very often, they feel that the time to be tested is if you have symptoms, but oftentimes they're not testing then either. They're saying self-isolate and watch the symptoms. So testing is one of the things that has to be more organized, and I suspect in the next four to six weeks it will be there will be a protocol rolled out for testing, but right now it's it's very much a mishmash. Okay, the person who submitted that question, would you like to unmute and respond? Okay, next question. If we had COVID, would our blood sugar levels indicate so? For example, would they go high for no apparent reason as a first symptom? Not necessarily. Some people go high even before they feel any of the symptoms when they have the flu, including COVID, and some do not. Some go low. If your blood sugars aren't where you would expect them, 
then one of the things you have to put into the mix of what is happening to me is, am I sick? And that's whether they're high or not. There is no definitive, your blood sugars are up, you are ill correlation. It it could be, (coughs) but you may even find that your blood sugars are low. And therefore, you're you're sick. It's very, very much individual. And some people, sometimes their blood sugars will go up and other times their blood sugars will go down. That is one of the reasons we say you can't predict, you have to test. Even if you were high all of the other times you were sick, this time you might be low and if you're cranking in sugar or insulin and your blood sugars are low you're going to be in trouble so you have to check and correct you can't just assume there's a person who asked that question like to respond yeah, thank you. I think you pretty much answered it um, before, but yeah, thanks so much. Um, I know it's like really hard to answer or kind of predict these things, but um, yeah, it's been really helpful actually listening to everyone else's questions. So thanks so much for doing this. You're more than welcome. Okay, I don't have any more COVID questions, but a lot of other self-management questions. So I want to give everyone um, a chance. Um, are there any more COVID specific questions that you'd like to ask Jerry? Um, Can I ask a question about comorbidities? Yes. Um, I'm curious if there's any data, I know we're early in this, about things like if you have type 1 diabetes and asthma and outcomes there. We think that the asthma is the one that's uh, more important than if with type 1 diabetes and COVID because, of course, asthma is a lung disease and COVID is a respiratory illness. So if if you're asking which and which one is the one that I'm most concerned about, it's the asthma. So, and, and certainly type 1 diabetes is nothing to fool around with with an illness. But with this particular one, be careful with the asthma. That also brings up other types of lung conditions. If you vape, you need to stop. If you smoke, today's the day you should be quitting. Recreational marijuana is is your choice but if you're smoking it we're in a COVID-19 and we need to not have any other assaults on our lungs your lungs are precious go to edibles if you have to but assaulting your lungs when we've got a respiratory illness that is killing people is not a great idea so um, but once again your asthma Keep an eye on it. Stay away from people. Wash your hands a lot. Clean your house. Try not to touch money. Money carries stuff. Use your credit card. Wipe your credit card off. Use your credit card. Um, Wipe your door handles off. Many people go for the Lysol wipes. You don't have to have Lysol. You can put five tablespoons of bleach and a gallon of water and use that as your cleansing solution. Better for your pets and your lungs because it doesn't smell as bad. Okay. um, Anyone else have any questions about COVID? Yeah, sorry. I have a follow-up to the asthma question. Yes, Um, sir. I've had pneumonia several times, and I've had the vaccine, but I heard that that doesn't make any difference to this virus. That's Um, right. So 
having had pneumonia puts me in a higher risk for the lung infection. Is that yes. correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. I would I would tell As you. As an ex smoker. <laughs> oh yes, and and I quit along with every other nurse. Hopefully they quit. Um, can I can I suggest that you are walking? Get up. Oh and yeah. Move. Get up I'm and trying. move. I'm trying. I have yes. back problems, so but I am out with yes. my dog every day. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I only quit smoking eight months ago after four years. More or more for years. So I, 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 the only question was, yeah, something I, that I, I, what I, I have to give you kudos. Good for you. <laughs> and, Thank you. And in this time of stress, I, you know, I quit, um, gosh, 40 years ago. Oh, and, my God. <laughs> and they say that the craving disappears i can tell you no it doesn't oh when i smell but, somebody smoking i just want one so bad but, but yeah kudos for you for quitting thank you okay that answered my question thank you take care great i'm going to go on to the more general self-management questions and we just got one in from jacob i'm 38 years old and a t1 um a t1d for about three months I'm trying to learn as much as I can, as fast as I can. It's a real struggle getting the feedback I need to understand my blood sugars and just the whole mess of things that come with diabetes. What are the things I should be doing uh, on, in the near and, um, and long term for my future health and knowledge? I feel that my current diabetes team is struggling to help onboard a new, di um, a new person with T1D at my age. Uh, joining the huddle is a great idea. It, 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 I, I know this sounds uh, um, learning from people who manage is one of the best things you can do. Learning what your blood sugars do when you do A, B, or C is another. Remembering that you've lost your automatic control, so you have to check and then correct. Your brain is now your new pancreas, and you will get there. Second thing you can do, and this doesn't, it's not self-evident, get support. If you're feeling overwhelmed, you're probably in about the right place. It is overwhelming. Know that you will come through this. I remember our first year. It was terrible. But now, if you come into my house, and my son no longer lives with us, but we also had the diabetic dog, Elvis, if you come into my house, you're pretty sure that we're all diabetic, including the three cats and the three dogs that we have now. It's a healthy way to live. You get support on incorporating what you need to do for yourself. It is a healthy way to live. And you can be quite healthy. Get mental health support for the long term. Um, as for things that you should be doing in the near and long term for future, get a window that you trust. Get someone you can see. If you don't click with that person, try somebody else. I like Adam Brown's 42 things that... Um, that affect my blood sugar because it encapsulates things that many, many healthcare professionals don't, <coughs> don't suggest or don't talk about. There's lots of things. Lastly, what you see is really what's going on. So trust yourself. Learn as much as you can, but trust yourself. What you're seeing is correct. Talk about it and make somebody listen so that you can figure out why and then you can get on with it. Last, remembering that you are not a diabetic. You are someone who lives with diabetes. Remember that so that when you're speaking, 
you don't become that diabetic person to everyone that you don't that you are a regular person who lives with a condition does that person want to um respond or do you have any comments remarks hey yeah thank you very much for that um it's it's quite a journey <laughs> it is it's not a journey that I would have chosen. It is a journey that was brought to us, and we have made it ours and and gotten on with it. Um, I remember, and I'll I'll tell you a little story. Old people tell stories. Um, I remember when my son was going to summer camp, and. He said to me, he was about seven, he said, I'll never be able to go away to, to sleepaway camp. We're Jewish. Jewish families use camp to um, to pass along many of the culture, much of the culture. And I, I took him aside and gave him a lecture and said, you're going to be able to do absolutely everything because we're going to make it possible. You are going to. Diabetes is not going to hold you back. And he looked at me and he said, well, there will be one thing I can't do. I can't go to space. And I started into my lecture again. And he said, Mom, our cousin is six foot eight. They only make the space suit to six feet. I'm going to be taller than that, so I can't go to space. <laughs> you can do absolutely everything I can. It's going to be harder for you, and you have to work harder but you can do it. So Jacob, um, we have at least five or six people in the huddle who got diagnosed between the ages of like 30 to 45. So when this is over, um, I will contact you and pair you up with someone, a couple people who totally understand what you're going through. Um, would that be good? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've got another a uh, more general question. I was recently at a presentation for the new Medtronic pump that can automatically monitor blood sugar levels. It was said that the time and target levels are becoming more important in monitoring C1G than A1C levels. Could you discuss whether this are, is true or not? Also, what is the range for monitoring time and target? The presenter said 4.2 to 10. And, and and I read that and, and thought that was an interesting time and target. As a, by the way, if you're pregnant, that would be too high. So it very much depends on you, your physical condition, your ability to manage your resources, whether or not you've got the time, and your load. If you're my age, 65, you don't want to have hypoglycemia because that's really deadly. But if you're Jacob's age at 38 and living with someone who would be able to help him, 10 might be too high. So discuss with your endocrinologist and develop some opinions for yourself. What do you like to wake up at? What makes you feel well and make your sugars better through the day so that you can do all of your activities. Where do you feel ill and why? Time and target is very individual. I want to go to the automatic blood sugar monitoring with the Medtronic pump. Medtronic pumps are great devices, but they are not self-driving cars. I suggest that a pump my husband drives a Mercedes. I drive a little Kia Soul. When we get into the car and drive to work, we both have to use our brakes. We both have to turn the thing on. We both have to use our steering wheel. We both have to keep an eye on the road. I can't just get into my car, even my husband's very fancy Mercedes, and turn it on and let it drive me. Medtronic pumps are just like that. They're very nice devices, and they do a great job, 
but you have to program them. You have to spend time working with it. You have to tell it what to do with this continuous blood glucose monitor. And I've heard estimates between two and four hours per week. And then it will, within the parameters that you've given it, it will stop and start your insulin as you've told it. However, let's say you've given it uh, instruction to give you a basal rate that is too high, you're going to have troubles. It's very much a programmed system that you're able to do about once a week and then it goes for that week and it will keep you within a certain range that you program. As a, by the way, and and the Medtronic pump is, there's Omnipod, there are a few others. Medtronic is linked with the CGM, so it will stop and start as your blood sugar is um, within certain ranges that you tell it. But you can get there without it. It's more work. It's the difference between my husband's Mercedes and my Kia Soul. It gets you there quite safely. There is a term called the poor man's pump. Check and correct. You may do more injections, but this device is not magic. you got to do the work or you won't get the results. And if you do the work, you will get the results whether you do multiple daily injections for example, my son does between 10 and 12 injections a day. He has come away from the pump, his choice, or whether or not you tell the pump you spend two to four hours a week programming it. It's up to you. Okay, the person who submitted that, would you like to respond? Uh, yes, okay, thank great. you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, this Hi, I just wanted to um, to add. Um, when I went to that presentation. I just I decided for the various reasons not to get the electronic pump for just because of the programming and things. And I use a Freestyle Libre and check frequently. And my time and target for what she said was was what they were aiming for already. So I just felt that I was more comfortable with the Freestyle Libre. And I've been a diabetic for so long that that I'm able to things that way. So, um, but, I, but I was a bit surprised when she said that they were using the time and target more than the hemoglobin A1C. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and that is something that is being discussed at this time. There, I, I go to all the conferences and the suggestion has been made and not every endocrinologist agrees with this. But the suggestion has been made that an A1C will be what's called a population assessment. So for to determine whether or not the population of people who live with type 1 diabetes is getting good control, we would use their A1C. But for individual control, we would use time and target. That as yet has not gained wide traction. Personally, um, I still use both. We, okay. we I, I've, I've been using both too, and I yes, because I had my time and target for what she said. My time and target on my freestyle libre was was way tighter than that, and that's why I was asking that question. So I think you've answered it well. Thank you. Okay, it's about 7.26. I'm going to read um, one last question. But again, if you are on the line and you haven't had your question asked, um, please stay on the line. So um, next, last question for our, this period, uh, Jerry, is what are some basic rules for insulin delivery if you have ketones? For example, if you have mild ketones, should you be correcting by 1.5 of your usual correction? And if you have high ketones, two, t two times? And, and I, you know, I, I feel like I never answer a question because I always say it depends. This is a discussion that every endocrinologist 
I swear, has a different a different answer. Sometimes 1.5 is dead on, and you you hit your blood sugars right, and it gets it down. Sometimes that's too much. My feel is that if your blood sugars are above 16, take and your keto. If your blood sugars are at target, and you have ketones in your blood of 0.6 and higher, the w common wisdom is 10% above your daily dose. So if you're taking um, 10 units of basal glar, you would take 11. Or if you're taking 10 units of Humalog, you would take 11. Once again, it depends how sensitive you are to insulin. And for some people, that would not nearly be enough, and others, it would be too much. They may just need half a unit. If you're above 16 and your ketones is 0 0.7 to 1.4, we think 15% above your usual dose is a safe estimate. Once again, that depends on your sensitivity. If you're running up to, up to above 1.5, and if you're using urine sticks of moderate to large ketones, we would suggest 20% above and call your diabetes team. Usually, if you're running ketones for more than 12 hours, I would say call your diabetes team, and I don't care if you're 0 0.6, you want to touch pace with somebody. What I do as a mother with diabetes, with a child with diabetes, when he ran ketones, we check and correct it every two hours. And if his blood sugar, and he, we've had seen blood sugars of 38, um, I would give him two and then check him 15 minutes later to make sure he was going down. We didn't have a freestyle at that point, and as a by the way, with the very high and very low. CGM is somewhat better, but freestyle is not great. However, if you're running high and don't have strips, use your freestyle, you're fine. Um, but you would have to check and correct every two hours. Once again, it, if you're having 0 0.6 with ketone strips, 10%, 7 to 14 with a blood sugar above uh, 16, 15%, and blood sugars above 16 with a ketone of 1.5, 20%. Have this conversation, though, before you get there with your endo, if at all possible. Okay, it's 7.30. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining our virtual huddle this month. It's very likely that we'll have another, sorry, go on. It's very likely we're gonna have an, um, the next month, we're gonna have another virtual huddle um, and possibly with a guest expert as well. So um, looking forward to seeing folks there. Those of you who submitted a question and didn't have it answered, please stay on the line or you can contact us offline. So thanks everyone um, who submitted a question, um, but those who submitted and didn't get an answer, um, you're free and welcome to stay online. Thank you. Okay, um, those of you who stayed online, um, please feel free to ask a question to Jerry. Do you know if anybody's with us? Hi, it's Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Hey, um, I was wondering about going to the grocery store with COVID and having type 1 um, as there's so many germs and things. Are there certain precautions we, sh we should be taking, like wearing gloves when we're shopping or just doing everything that's already been said, keeping the distance and everything? 
we we don't know, Nikki, if wearing gloves is going to protect you. Can't okay. hurt if you if you own the gloves and um but we don't know. We do know that keep your hands off your face and that's more of a trick than you'd think. Um, yeah. and wash your hands every hour. Go to the WHO um uh, site to really learn how to wash your hands and wash them well. Um, stay six feet away from everyone. Make sure you go to a a cashier with a plexiglass in between you and them. And if you can, use your credit card. Wash off your credit card before you do, and then use your credit card so you're not handling money. When you get home, wash your hands. Okay, good enough. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? So we do have about 19 people on the call, including us. We, we have 19 people on the call? Uh, including us, yes. Okay. Um, is anyone else on the call that wanted to ask Jerry a question? Please feel free to do so. Um, our session, our formal session is over because um, it's past 7.30, but we're happy to answer questions if your questions were not answered. I, I have another one if nobody has one. Sure, go ahead. Um, so my work, I've put in a shut door policy today. And daily, I have couriers that need to drop things off for customers of mine. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that um, the couriers are wearing a mask and gloves. And there's always packages every day. I don't, I'm wondering what I can do about this. Um, now, are yeah. your couriers bringing cardboard boxes? Yeah, cardboard boxes. Surprisingly, which just kind of blew me away when I, I saw this today, the longest viability, the place that the COVID lasts the longest, is stainless steel and plastic. The place that oh. they last the least is cardboard. Okay, that's good. That's a good thing. So yeah. all your Amazon packages are probably fine. Yeah, because that's what's coming in a lot. And I'm wondering, just opening the door, because I have to, I'm locking the door to the public right now. But opening what, the what door do do? and taking, I manage a large storage facility. Okay. And you want to not handle money if you can get not having, if you handle money, you go wash your hands for a minute. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the public's been do really you, good about that. And do you have now a plexi? I'm not it. Do you have any No, like I glass? actually shut, sorry, I shut the door completely to the public, so I'm not handling anything. It's all over the phone and email. The only Perfect. people that I need to open the door for are the couriers, because I don't have a drop box, and a lot of the packages okay. are bigger. So I want I have you to, to wash. Open the door. Okay. If, if you can, wash yep. your um, your... Um, the doorknobs about yep. you know every couple of hours. Bleach solution, mm -hmm. a third of a cup of bleach in a gallon of water. Give it a wash, and don't you know don't blow it dry. Let it dry on its own. Alcohol apparently isn't as good. Do the bleach. Um, Is that still safe? safe though to be doing this? It's like opening the door with the close contact and just taking the box. How it's close only about are a five. Uh, like a couple, three, four feet. Enough just to open the door and grab the package. Can they put it down and step back? Yeah, there's no awning in front of my door. I can do that for now. When it's raining, it'll be a different story. Unless I, I would think do six of something. feet if you can. I would do six feet if you can. Put an umbrella out that you tie to your door and put it under the umbrella. If you can stay away from a person for six feet, 
Yeah, I was thinking about the umbrella and maybe talking to the owner and seeing about buying like a, a tent sort of thing um, to put over by the entrance. Yeah, yeah. and okay. the cardboard is actually your friend. Okay, that's good and, to know. I a, had no idea. This is a decent study. I, I'm kind of anal about decent studies, and it seems that cardboard is not one of the things that is going to uh, spread a COVID. Plastic is, surprisingly. Mm-hmm, yeah, none of the packages are plastic. So yeah. it was more just and the seeing them and opening the door I was getting nervous about. Um, yeah. I'm not sure, yeah. but maybe see, I should be wearing see, a mask when I open the door. The the mask is, is good for your your psyche, but not so great otherwise. It's not that helpful. If you okay. have someone coughing, it, it will keep their their um, coughing into them to themselves. You hope, but the mm-hmm. masks that have been there aren't that helpful. So staying away is helpful. Yeah, I, yeah. And and you can, you know, even even a great big IKEA umbrella that. You know, one of the, uh, even one of your regular little umbrellas, tell them to pop it under there and step back. Yeah, that's a good idea. You know, give them a plastic bag that they can put it, well, plastic, I don't. don't Well, I was thinking of getting maybe a Tupperware, but that's plastic. Yeah, plastic. Plastic. Yeah. Yeah. I like the cardboard, but not the plastic. But the plastic is what is good in the rain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're you're darned either way. But I would, if it's raining, is it going to go through the cardboard? If if it's out uh, there, like somebody puts it down, knocks on the door, steps back six feet, and you go, how long? Is it no, I think that would be safe. Maybe I'll do that. Yeah, I would do that. I would have them step back. So today at um, at my door, I had a package delivered, and I asked the man to step back. He left it there and and said, "You good?" And I waved, and that was it. Okay, good. Yeah, and the cardboard is actually uh, one of the safer ones. Stainless steel had COVID last a very long time. Wow. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah, uh, who knows? It's changing daily, and there's not a lot of there's yeah, so many this, things we don't know. Yeah, this is actually a study. It's not just, you know, I think. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I hope it helps. Stay safe. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. You too. Take care. Okay, anyone else like to ask a question? I know we have six on the call, so um, any of you six, if you're still on the call and wanted a quest to ask a question, please feel free to do so. I, I just want to say if everyone's feeling stressed, this is stressful. This is appropriate. You're stressed because it's stressful. Um, reach out. Yeah, so many, so many people have been saying to me, oh, Nikki, you have type 1, you, you know, you're in rough shape if you get oh, it and don't like, don't you love all the people who want to tell you <laughs> what you are Gosh. oh i know it's been non-stop i mean and, and or what you though. can eat and and or yeah. not you know everybody's the expert um i mean they're i feel like they're doing it out of care though and genuine yeah. like just worry so i'm yeah. just trying to I wasn't really sure how to respond to it at first because everything was brand new with COVID. But the more research and everything that I've been reading, if you're if you manage your diabetes well, um, one of the you're no we more found, likely. Mm-hmm. One of the things we found, Nikki, and and I, I'm interested if this is your experience, is that your your ability to have kind of a gray area with your health is gone. You're either really, really healthy or not so much. 
most people mm-hmm. who manage their diabetes are really, really healthy. So that I often wonder about the general population if they realize how much work you do and how much mm-hmm. you actually put into your health. I suspect mm-hmm. you're not a smoker. Mm-mm. No. You're not a big drinker. No. Those are the things that seem to be with in in the countries that are having high um high rates of death with COVID and everybody's afraid of that. And that's one of the reasons they think men get it more often other than just a high hemoglobin. They're more likely mm-hmm. to be big drinkers. They're more likely to smoke. Those are the people that are really sick. People yeah. who live with type 1 are often perceived to be sickly. And that's kind of historical. That should not be the case now. The folks that are self-managing, who are on top of it, are well people. And Maybe should... healthier than the uh, people that yeah, don't have. Yeah, I think so, so, Nikki. But... I do. So, <laughs> so hold your head up and give some advice and tell them to eat yeah. broccoli and wash their hands and, you know, what you do for your health. Okay. Thank you. And reach out, reach out. And remember how much you do and how well you do. Oftentimes, we look at a blood sugar, I don't know, a stray blood sugar of 19 and think, I'm not doing anything right. Yeah, you are. And you have mm-hmm. a, a high blood sugars because you live with diabetes, mm-hmm. not because you're not doing a good job. You are, and remember that. Thank you. I have one more question about MDI. Um, I've been yeah, trying sure to use my thigh, my thigh and my arm more because I was using my stomach constantly, and I'm finding I'm not sure if it's scar tissue because I'm still newly diagnosed, but Ask, it's, okay. the needle is hurting me. And I went to my thigh and I used the same dosage as I would in my stomach, yes. and my numbers skyrocketed. And and. What which insulin is hurting you? Well, it's not the insulin that's hurting. It's like the needle, and I'm not. Maybe I'm poking where scar tissue has started to develop in my stomach. Well, and, and just just as a by the way, the scar tissue, lithotripsy. I can't even say the word. You can't really feel it. They we there was a a very interesting study that I believe Trisha was involved in, where they looked at nurses feeling for this scar tissue and patients feeling and then they did ultrasound to check to see if they could if if experienced nurses and patients could feel the scar tissue and they found that we missed about 75 percent of them we didn't feel very many the best Hmm. the best time to find scar tissue is when you're in the shower soaked up and feeling warm, and then you gently rub in, but you will Mm -hmm. miss most. If you find you've got an area where you do have a lesser absorption rate, then Mm -hmm. avoid it. Move your stuff around. You are going to get some scar tissue, and there is absolutely nothing you can do. This is an acid you're putting in it. Move it around as much as you can. What we think is your most reliable absorption is around your stomach. You'll get faster absorption on your legs, although with you, obviously not, and less so on your arms. Move it around. See where it's good. And one finger width along for each injection. Many, many, yeah. many, many, many people reuse their needles. If you do choose to reuse your needle, don't use alcohol to clean it and run it underwater. Only you recap it. They think oh. that reusing the needle causes more scarring, but I'm not a It fan definitely of that causes research. more pain. 
it definitely causes more pain. I, I've used it twice before, or um, and, and it and, hurt more, definitely. And, and a funny story, my son took six needles with him to the University of Michigan, leaving in September. I swear he came back in December with exactly the same six needles. The day when he was under seven, I care not. He's getting his insulin. He's taking 10 yeah. to 12 injections a day. He's not the perfect diabetic. He mm-hmm. does have control. Do what you got well, my to do. Friend, my friend uses her thigh, and she recommended it, and I was excited to try a different area, and maybe I should try it longer, um, but my numbers did not react the same, and I ate the exact same thing and took the same amount of units as I did in my stomach. Try your tuchus. Your back end, you kind of wear that hip area where you got a little fat. Everybody's uh-huh. got it there. Yeah, try over there. Okay. And where on your thigh are you putting it? I tried like uh, three, four inches above my knee. Okay. You know where you, if you're slapping your side to get your dog to come? Try oh, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. where you're saying I'm gaining weight and you grab your thigh and you pinch yeah. up? Try there. Okay, like How higher you... by your butt. Yeah. How long are your needles? I'm using a four millimeter. Yeah, most people. I, I've only had one in my practice, and I've been a nurse a very long time, one in my practice who needed longer. Even if you're heavy, you don't need longer than four. No, I find longer hurts more. I've tried all yeah. different sizes, and I yeah. like the shorter ones better. Yeah, the four is good. Okay, that's yeah. great. Thank you. Can, Take care. Can I say you something will. about that question? Yes. Yeah, because I had the same problem with my needles hurting me when I took them. I was newly diagnosed in January, and I actually switched needle brands, and since I've switched them, I don't get the pain anymore. Well, which one doesn't cause pain for you? The Nova Twist. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I because I was on. Twist. Oh, really? And you still had the same problem? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I just I just wanted to make sure because like I thought it was really weird that I switched needle tip heads and then like suddenly I don't have that pinching pain problem anymore when I like stab myself. Oh, that's awesome. But. Yeah. Best of luck to you, though. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's okay. Thank you. It's not bad. It's not bad. I just wanted to ask Jerry. <laughs> just yeah, no, you never it. know. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, that's actually a really good point to try different needles. Mm-hmm. Try different areas. Try different needles. Um, be careful not to inject after a hot shower because apparently that makes your insulin go in faster um oh i thought it was vi- i thought it was before a hot shower don't inject. well before it's, it's, after it's when you want you don't want to be too hot um oh, okay i found that my son finds that when his sugars are high his pain is exponential it just he just can't take even a hangnail it just makes him when his sugar sugars come down it's better and that's with injections. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So so look for that sort of of thing. Mhm. I will. Yeah. Okay, great. Um any else? If not, we can um if you still have questions, we can talk to you offline. I'm good. Okay, thanks guys. And remember if you if you have any other questions, just um contact us offline and um Jerry will be able to talk to you then. Thank you.